Well of Souls is a very difficult game to talk about. I'm willing to bet that an overwhelming majority of you people watching have never played or probably even heard of this game. And to clarify, no, I'm not talking about the chosen Well of Souls that was covered by Accursed Farms, which for some reason people say I sound like? I don't know, I don't hear it. I'm also not talking about Dragonfire The Well of Souls, a Swedish produced Baldur's Gate clone. I'm talking about an incredibly obscure online PC game released sometime in the late 90s by the developer Synthetic Reality. And it's not difficult to talk about because it isn't interesting. It was an indie game during a time when indie games weren't really a thing, and it could have been quite possibly one of the first MMORPGs ever made. Yet despite that, Well of Souls is probably one of the most obscure games I will ever talk about on the channel. And normally when I talk about a game, I often discuss its impact. I talk about how its designs influence the future of gaming or what you can learn through its gameplay or stories. Sometimes though, you can't measure the impact a game had. Its obscurity was just so great that the ripples that it made never really caused waves. Its history mainly lost in time and the only records are half forgotten memories scattered among a few thousand people. Its designs, while potentially well ahead of its time, are now so commonplace that even with context, it's nearly impossible to fully appreciate by today's standards. Well, Souls, while quite possibly being the earliest MMO, didn't really influence what came after it. And it's quite likely that the creators of EverQuest or World of Warcraft didn't even know of its existence. However, sometimes the metric which you measure a game isn't about its place in history, but one of personal experience. One where its value is based on the impact it had on an individual's life. This game, despite its simplistic nature, was what made me realize that a future in game design was even possible. And if it wasn't for this game, there's a good chance I wouldn't be making videos today. Simply put, it is easily one of the most influential games in my life. So I feel it's only right that after all these years, I make a video on it. This is Design Documentaries, an in-depth look at a game's history, design, and legacy. So listen up, you unmuzzled common kissing pigeon eggs. It's time I talk to you about Well of Souls. <laughs> Well of Souls was developed and published by Synthetic Reality, a small indie developer. And by small indie developer, I effectively mean one person. Dan Samuel, also known as Samson, or as he would be known by the community, Uncle Dan. Growing up in the 50s, Uncle Dan wasn't exposed to a lot of video games, though he was fascinated by computers. At an early age, he found a book called We Build Our Own Computer at his local library and from there would spend the rest of his life working with computers. He would eventually graduate from Stanford in the 60s with a bachelor's in mathematical science and a master's in computer science. And his first job out of college was creating cards for many computers like the HP 2100 and the DEC PDP 11. That was back in the day when you had to design hardware to handle exceptionally complicated tasks. You know, like telling time. In Dan's own words, people paid 500 for a plug-in card that provided a non-volatile time and date. A clock. $500. Didn't come with a computer. He would later join his startup with his former professor, Nobel Prize winner Melvin Schwartz, where he would work at the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory and would assist his boss with several projects at Brookhaven. Through his boss, he met an early Steve Jobs whom his professor would allow to sit in his class. Jobs and Samuel had known about each other and Steve would offer Dan a position as the seventh employee at Apple, a position that Dan would ultimately refuse. I turned him down, even though it would have been the dream of my life to have lived that experience. It was probably a bad call on my part, as you really should follow your bliss. I can't say I regret my decision because from what I've learned, I would have been one of the guys Steve didn't want to give stock to, and that I would have regretted. 
and he witnessed Walter Cronkite play Space War in 1969, which was a pretty historic event for gaming history in its own right. Back when computers were seen as these massive room-filling machines, which instilled the public with a fear of complete uncaring automation, which turned out to be totally wrong because today they don't fill rooms. It was a demonstration to show that computers could be a way for humans to have fun and entertain themselves, quite possibly the first positive record for gaming. In a way, it was that moment that inspired Uncle Dan to become interested in game development. See, Space War would go on to inspire a Star Trek based game. It was a simple command line input game that required you to shoot down Cleon ships. Though the game was for teletype, which meant it had to print out a sheet after each move. Uncle Dan wanted to create his own version that would be multiplayer and real time, and possibly save a couple of trees in the process. That wouldn't come for quite a while though. He stayed at his job for 17 years though he started moving to software development. Uncle Dan witnessed the birth of personal computers and started playing games on his Apple II, a computer that in some alternate universe he might have developed, and trust me, the irony wasn't lost on him either. He would eventually get a Nintendo Entertainment System for his then young son as a way of having a bonding experience with him. He played games like The Legend of Zelda and Super Mario Bros. 2, and he also said he was a fan of games like Dragon Warrior, Final Fantasy, and would continue to buy consoles for games like Suikoden. But as much as he enjoyed playing games, that itch to create them never left. It was around this time when Uncle Dan would meet Ken Winograd, a fellow software developer he would meet during the days of CompuServe. They became pen pals and would talk about all sorts of things, and it was during these exchanges that Ken would give Dan the most important piece of advice that Dan had ever heard. Follow your bliss. Even though he had heard that before, specifically from a Joseph Campbell documentary, when it came from Ken it felt more tangible and real. Dan took that to ultimately mean that he should spend every amount of free time he had working on creating games. The first game he would create was called Net Spades, and as you can probably guess, it was a game of spades you can play over the internet. His philosophy was that, I figure the game is usually just an excuse to chat. Give someone a chat program and they clam up in front of the mic, distract them with the game and they jabber away freely. It was one of the first online card games to ever be released to the public. And though he didn't have the foresight to patent it, it also frustrated many attempts to patent it by others. Soon after that, Uncle Dan decided he was going to finally make the game he wanted to make since college. That game was called Warpath. Much like Space War and Trek in the early 70s, it was a space exploration game. You had to explore planets, mine for resources, build up your planet's defenses, make allies with neutral aliens, and fight other enemy ships to wipe out any trace of red in the galaxy. And it was both multiplayer and real-time, no printer required. He released it for Windows 3.x and promoted it via word of mouth on BBS forums. Much to his surprise, Uncle Dan found Warpath on several shareware compilations. Some of them even asked. It was a success that convinced him to commit to his company, creating SyntheticReality.com where he continued to create games. He would go on to design several sequels to Warpath. He created Arcadia which was an online social toy box where people could play billiards, make music, play board games, play multiplayer fight simulations, SimCit, I mean SimVille. There was also Rocket Club, a multiplayer online real-time team and tournament based multi-terrain space action adventure strategy game simulation with RPG elements and an extensible open-ended design for player customizations. You know, that genre that everyone was doing in the early 2000s. There were also several demos and proof of concepts hosted on his site, and of course, the topic of this video, Well of Souls. As mentioned before, Well of Souls was an online multiplayer role-playing game, and depending on your definitions of the genre, could be considered one of the earliest MMORPGs ever in active development. Conceived in 1995, it was being developed during the same time as Ultima Online. And it's difficult to say which one of these games was putting down code first. Only Meridian 59 managed to beat both of these games to the punch, having started development as early as 1994. Though if your definitions are a bit more broad, you may consider early MUDs or online games like Neverwinter Nights, the 1991 version anyway, to be the first MMORPGs. Or if you're a bit more strict with your definitions, you could make the argument that Well Souls wasn't really an MMO at all. It wasn't exactly massive. 
with a maximum of 20 people in the official server. However, he was using his mixed server software that he created for Warpath, and it effectively allowed anyone to host as much as their bandwidth could handle. Which, back when it was common that the most you had was a 56k modem, admittedly wasn't very much. But now it wouldn't be outrageous to host hundreds of players. Also, you aren't limited to the official servers either. Anyone could host and moderate their own server, even if the main server were to permanently go offline. So that's a huge plus for game preservation. But besides that argument, it was non-instanced, players were able to form parties, interact with each other, and fight and trade, add guilds and leaderboards, nearly everything you expect in the genre. If it isn't an MMO, it's pretty damn close to one. So when people talk about the history of MMOs, why isn't Well of Souls considered in the discussion? Well, that's most likely because the game technically never left Alpha. When it was released on January 1st, 1999, it was under an open Alpha. Even when the latest updates released in 2008, it was still designated as an Alpha release. While you could argue that's just semantics because the game is completely playable, Back in the early release, it was probably far more accurate of the game's state. That doesn't necessarily diminish Well of Souls' contribution. I mean, it was still in development around the same time as the very first MMORPGs. And considering when it started development, MMOs weren't even a thing at the time. And by all accounts, it was still the first indie-developed MMORPG ever made. And to me, that makes it all the more impressive. That said, Uncle Dan didn't set out to make the first MMORPG. Instead, Well of Souls was a project he worked on with his son, Ben Samuel, as a way of having a bonding experience. They were inspired by one of their favorite games, The Legend of Zelda, more precisely The Adventure of Link, and wanted to make an online version of it. You can see this inspiration with how the game looks. It features an overhead map with side perspective combat scenes, and you can still find some remnants of this bonding experience. For example, typing in slash homework gives you a program that Uncle Dan used to help his son with his homework. And even some of the monsters were designed by Ben himself, notably the disco freak and the carnivorous hat. Mr. Samuel had admitted that he had very little artistic ability. The reason he was able to start on the project at all was because he used software that would generate fractal geometry to generate overworld maps and he mostly borrowed pictures from the internet to create assets. It's hard to say whether or not his own art was better than Ben's, but regardless, he didn't let that stop him. It wasn't until a man named Josh Wartz had seen one of the early alphas and completely unprompted, gifted Uncle Dan hundreds of art assets to use in his game. Dan had admitted that if it wasn't for Josh's skins, he doubted that anyone would have played past version 1. However, just as mysteriously as he had arrived, Josh Wartz left, never to be seen, or heard from again. To this day, who Josh Wartz was and where he went remains an unsolved mystery. But for every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, that knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is watching. Perhaps it's you. If anyone has any information regarding the case presented tonight, please email suburdorfcopyright at gmail.com with the header Where's Josh Wartz with any information. If you wish, you need not give your name. Design documenters will be back after these messages. Sober Dwarf's content is refreshing, genuine, and wholly unique in the oversaturated space that is video game channels on YouTube. He researches and speaks on topics I would never think to look up, and as someone who doesn't always have time to play, much less investigate video game history, that is something incredibly valuable. That is why I'm happy to support Sober Dwarf and encourage anyone else who has an interest in video games to give his channel a chance. When you look at it through a modern day lens, Well of Souls might come across as a bit primitive in its design. There isn't anything particularly novel about its core gameplay mechanic. You traveled around, clicked on monsters until they died, or they killed you, you gained experience until you leveled up, increased your stats, got new weapons and armor, then repeated that cycle until you reached max level. Partially because it was inspired by early Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior, it is all about that grind combat wasn't really that deep or intricate, and there wasn't a ton of variation or choices to make. There were different classes that you can choose from, but the only real difference between them were the weapons that they could use and how focused they were between physical and magical damage, with two exceptions. 
The scavenger could only use weapons that were dropped from enemies, and the beggar could only use weapons that were given to him by other players. There was also a pianist, which sucked at pretty much everything. It's my favorite class. There were quests, but there wasn't much, if any, overall goal or narrative. In fact, you can't even beat the game. Uncle Dan had intentionally made the game so you could not fight the final boss, technically. You could fight random encounter versions of the final boss, even multiple of them, but the story was intentionally made to be incomplete because he never wanted the game to feel finished for both him or the players. Not that you're missing out on an epic conclusion of any kind, because any story there is pretty nonsensical. For example, in one of the quests, you meet a pair of wolves. One of them has a cold and asks you to find out the secret of fire. You meet a doctor who's working to try to discover it, but he needs a lens and some kindling. To get the lens, you find two guards lost in a treasury, and they need a map to get to where they need to go. So you get a map from a bookstore who doesn't actually sell any books, and you return to fight a monster and get a spare monocle from one of the guards. To get the kindling, you meet a beaver who has a toothache. So you go to the vet who's having trouble sleeping because of a nightmare, which actually turns out to be a real monster, so you fight that. He gives you the tooth medicine to give to the beaver who gives you the spare wood for kindling. You take both the lens and the kindling to the doctor who teaches you the secret of fire, give it back to the wolves who give you a stick with a string on it as a reward, which just so happens to be the best bow in the game. Go figure. Needless to say, the game didn't take itself seriously at all, but there's something charming about the odd sense of humor the game has. There's even some minor things like the description on items, or even chat filters so you can make everyone speak Leek or Shakespearean or Leet Shakespearean. There's even a random insult generator so you can call people a tottering, bat fouling haggard. Despite its simplicity though, there was a surprising amount of depth and content that could be found. For example, there's actually two experience systems, EXP and PP. <laughs> yes, I know, I'm like six years old, shut up. <laughs> experience points were for leveling, but PP, or participation points, was what allowed you to learn new spells proficiencies. There was a pet battling system in which nearly every monster in the game could be tamed and used as a pet to help you out in combat, or fight other people's pets. There was a stock market system that, if I recall correctly, whose value would actually go up or down determined by actions of other players. There were several mini-games and even a fully functioning tactics-based version of Well as Souls included in the main game. But one of my favorite things is something that Uncle Dan calls player extensibility, or the idea that players could make additions to his games. With Well as Souls, this comes in the form of skins, or more or less your character's avatar. While the game had quite a few characters that you could choose from the start, you could create your own entirely from scratch. The character skins were simple MS Paint files that you could create and share, allowing you to show off your own artwork to whoever else was playing. That could be an original creation, a sprite ripped from another game, or somewhere between the two. Over the course of playing, you could get thousands of skins made by other people. That was something back then that I couldn't really fully appreciate, but now I realize just how amazing that was, even to this day. And this player extensibility is something that's a bit of a trademark within all Synthetic Realities games. Uncle Dan called this kitchen sink design. It's the idea that you throw in anything you find interesting into the game and just allow it to find its place. In his own words, if I have an idea I want to work on, I add it to whatever project I have in progress, regardless of whether it makes sense in there or not. Admittedly, it's not something you should do in order to have a coherent design, but it's the many multiple facets that gave Wall of Souls a lot of its charm. I attack. I die. It felt like a cluttered toy box, but it's also what made the game feel unique. It always felt like there was something you could do to distract yourself and be social with, even well after you did all the quests and got to max level. And really, if you think about it, it's not all that different from MMOs that have been around for a long time. I mean, Final Fantasy XI has to make up words now to create game modes. On top of all of this, and probably the most impressive, the game was entirely free. You didn't have to buy the game, you didn't have to pay for a subscription, there was no free to play elements, the most you could do was buy a golden soul. But outside of a few very minor benefits you got from buying it, such as your name being gold, that was it. You got the full game for absolutely nothing. 
In fact, almost all the games Dan created were free or pretty close to it. And to be perfectly honest, that was one of the main reasons I was able to play it back in the day. At the start of the video, I said that Well of Souls was one of the most influential games I have ever played. Simply put, it is easily one of the most influential games in my life. To understand why, I need to give you a bit of context. Growing up in the early 90s, I was primarily a console gamer. Believe it or not, it was only a few short years ago that I got into PC gaming. And that was when I built my first computer for the channel. Well, as a child, we did have a family computer, an Acer Aspire Desktop 460, that I believe my dad's workplace gave to him so he could work from home. The most I had access to in terms of PC gaming were the copies of Let's Explore the Airport and Are You Afraid of the Dark? The Tale of Orpheo's Curse. And those came bundled with the computer. After years of begging to upgrade our desktop, the end result was a game that could finally run Half-Life on the lowest settings, while everyone else was playing Battlefield 1942. But with that computer also came the internet, and with the internet, I was exposed to something in my adolescence that would change my life forever. Something that's been part of my life since I first discovered it, and has remained a constant in my internet search history to this day. Oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Free, downloadable games. In an era before Steam, most of my gaming experience on a PC was in the form of freeware, shareware, abandonware, early emulation, and flash games. These games would often be simple enough that my computer could run it without catching fire, and affordable enough that it didn't eat into my allowance of zero dollars a week. While you might think that seems limiting, that limitation is what allowed me to experience many games and genres that I would probably have normally overlooked. When I would buy a game, I made absolutely sure it was something that I would enjoy for months, because most likely I would have to. Except that one time I let my friend convince me to buy Rampage for the Nintendo 64 with my birthday money, and to this day I have never let him live that down. Even when I would rent games, I would often lean towards save choices because I didn't want to waste a weekend. But with PC gaming, I would often take gambles on things I didn't think I would enjoy and would often be surprised. It's how I discovered games like Princess Maker 2, Dwarf Fortress, and Warning Forever. Even without resorting to piracy, sometimes you would find full games available, such as Titans of Steel, Warring Sons, and Castle Wolfenstein Enemy Territory. Well of Souls was different, though. It was far from the most technically impressive game I played at the time. It wasn't even my first online experience, I had played Fantasy Star Online months prior. It's easy to say that Well of Souls was the gateway that led me to Final Fantasy XI, and that game also changed my life in many ways, but even then that's not why Well of Souls is important. I guess it's time to come clean. This entire time, I've technically been misleading you. Well of Souls isn't a game. Evergreen is the name of the game I had been talking about. Well of Souls is actually a game engine. Not just a game engine either. Similar to RPG Maker, Well of Souls allows you to create your own online RPG, and many people did. There were dozens of available worlds to play through, each with their own stories and designs. From original worlds like Arianel, to a Dragon Ball Z online RPG long before Xenoverse, to Mega Man and Castlevania and Monster Hunter inspired worlds, all with varying degrees of quality and completeness. Even if you didn't care for the default world of Evergreen, you might have found a world that you've enjoyed, and some of them were quite well made and designed, and it inspired me to want to create my own games. Well of Souls was my first experience with game design. When I was probably no older than 15 years old, I had attempted to make my own game. The thing is, back in the day, the idea of becoming an actual game developer was sort of a pipe dream to me. I had wanted to create games, but up until then, I couldn't even begin to describe to you the process that went into making a game, let alone the intricacies of programming and designs. It was something that I wanted to do. I wanted nothing but to be a game designer, but I never thought I would be able to do it. Here before me was this engine that, while not nearly as complex as coding a game from scratch, had taught me about programming, different functions, variables, dialogue branches, editing tables, event flags, 
and many other things. Uncle Dan had heavily documented this information so that people could understand it and create their own games. And it was his notes that led me to my very first game design experience. Though my world would have never been published, lost due to a formatted hard drive from downloading way too many songs on peer-to-peer -peer networks, I mean, give me a break, it was the 2000s. I remember for months after school, I would spend hours working on creating my own stories, my own epic battles, creating my own art and testing out what I made. There was no feeling more satisfying to a 15 year old sober than starting with nothing but an idea and creating something. And I get that same feeling while making videos. Also, it's just so incredibly impressive even to this day. I mean, really think about it, just how many game engines in the world allowed you to create your very own MMO. Well, before I got into making my own world, this was also the first experience I had with pixel art. Listen, I wasn't smart enough back then to know how to rip sprites. So when I made my own characters, I'd just often redraw them pixel by pixel. I realized I could make minor changes to customize it, and that's what led me into learning how to make sprites. It was Well of Souls what enabled me to realize that creating video games wasn't out of my reach, and as a result, it's what led me into studying as much about game design as I could. I wanted to know the history of my favorite games and how they made them, and what made those games so enjoyable because one day I wanted to make my own games. And all that excess experience and knowledge is what ultimately led me to create Soberdorf. In a way, it's a bit poetic that I'm talking about the game that ended up starting it all to begin with. Unknowingly, I had followed the same advice that was given to Uncle Dan when he started his journey over 30 years ago. Follow your bliss. He followed his, and by doing so, taught me that I could follow mine. Unfortunately, not many people had the same experience. Well of Souls, or any synthetic reality game, didn't amount to a major success for Dan. There are no known numbers for how many people might have actually played it, but it would be a generous estimate to say that less than 50,000 people experienced Well of Souls for themselves. And due to the free nature of the game, even that success didn't make Dan much money, saying that he was thankful that it at least paid for itself. However, Uncle Dan stated that he didn't regret making it, and it was stories like mine that made it all worth it. Well, Souls continued to receive updates until as far back as 2008, ending on the 97th update for the game, though it's hard to say just how many people were still playing it by then. However, if you are interested, you can still play Well of Souls today. I can't verify for Windows 10, but it ran perfectly fine on my Windows 7 computer. And Uncle Dan said he was interested in creating a Steam version of the game. And believe this or not, while I was playing for footage, there were still people playing it online. Granted, it was only about two or three people, but still. It goes to show that there are still people out there besides me who remember it. And it's entirely free, so it's something that you can experience for yourself if you wish. As for what happened to synthetic reality in Uncle Dan, well, even after all these years, he's still following his bliss. He is currently working on several projects, his main focus being a game called Sin Space Drone Runners for Android, and he's also created a version of Warpath for Android phones, and has been working on Well of Souls Rune Runners, and even his son, Ben Samuel, had become a game designer and published author. I had asked Dan personally if there is anything he wanted to say in particular. So for Josh Wirtz, if you're out there, he hopes you're having a fantastic life. To everyone else, follow your bliss. Do something that you enjoy doing and nothing can go all that horribly wrong, unless you most enjoy doing the exactly wrong things. But mostly anything you'd like to do is interesting to a bunch of other people as well, and sharing that journey makes it just all the more special. And to everyone who has ever played a synthetic reality game, thank you, you guys rock. And from me to Uncle Dan, Thank you. When he started Synthetic Reality, he might not have realized that his game would inspire at least one person to get into game design, to give them an avenue that allowed them to follow their bliss. But for that, I'm extremely grateful. As for me to you, this is Soberdorf reminding you to also follow your bliss. Take it from someone who at many points never thought he would be able to who always told themselves that they would never be good enough or successful enough, who struggles with feelings of 
depression, anxiety, and fears of rejection and failure. Who thought all doors were closed before I even had the chance to approach them. Doing whatever that push is in your life is one of the best decisions you can make for yourself. Whether it's becoming a game designer, becoming a streamer, finally making that YouTube channel, or whatever inner desire that you have that you've been keeping yourself from doing. I'm not saying it's easy and it's not a promise that will lead to success. Admittedly, there are probably more struggles than you could possibly imagine. However, from my own personal experience, that bliss will lead you to places that you never thought possible, and doors may open where you would never expect them. This month, Soberdorf turns 4 years old. Many people say that the channel is underrated and that I deserve more subs and videos of mine deserve way more views. And those compliments mean a lot to me and I hope that I can both find the success that many of you believe I deserve and that no matter how big I get, I'll always be seen as an underrated channel. But numbers and analytics does not reflect just the breadth of experience I've found and the doors that have opened for me. During that time, I have experienced many things that I have never thought possible. By following my bliss, I have met a community that has become an extended family that I never thought I would have. With it, I have met many wonderful friends and people that have shown me compassion that I never thought possible. With it, I have experienced many different things that I never imagined, such as editing the videos of the people who inspired me to make videos to begin with, and it allowed me to discover a love I never thought I would find. Following my bliss allowed me to experience many, many things, and gaining that experience built character. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Sorry it took so long, but as you can tell this video was a bit more in depth than almost any other project I have made on a channel. I actually had an interview with Dan himself, so if you would like to read that, there is a link of a Google Doc in the description below, as well as links to his current projects that you can support if you're interested. Speaking of support, there are now multiple ways you can support the channel. You can now help the channel out by becoming a member via YouTube. For 5 and some change, you can get a badge showing how long you've been supporting, as well as some cute Soberdorf emojis to use. And as always, you can support the channel using Patreon, the Humble Partner link, or just buy my lunch using Kofi. In addition to keeping the channel going so I can continue making videos like these, your support grants you access to the Soberdorf Discord, the ability to ask me questions on the upcoming expansion packs, and your name alongside these wonderful people that have been helping the channel. And obviously you can always support the channel by subscribing, hitting that notification bell, sharing it with someone, or simply leaving a feel good comment. Thanks again and this is Soberdorf reminding you to follow your bliss.